Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, it's good to have everybody in, and uh, we're ready for another half-hour program. And again, we'd like to invite our television audience to join with us here in the studio as we open the Word and trust you study with us. And uh, as you study, ask the Lord to enlighten you, because after all, as we constantly stress, unless the Lord opens our heart, this is a closed book. And so as you study with us, you also prayerfully ask the Lord to open the truth to your understanding. Again, we always like to remind our television audience, because we know every day we have new listeners, that all our past programs are available on either the video or the audio or the printed page. And if you're interested in any of that, you drop us a note or call us and we'll get that out to you. Also, if you would be interested in our newsletter, which we send out quarterly, it's nothing that humongous or anything, but it at least gives you an awareness of where we are in our seminars and uh, various stations that we're picking up. If you're not getting our newsletter, you uh, drop us a note on that as well, and uh, we'll get them out to you free of charge. Okay, I think that's all of our announcements, and we'd like to get right back into the Word as quickly as possible. Back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and now we're going to go right on into the next verse, verse 6. Now, I'm not going to do a lot of review again on this program. I did that last half hour. And the uh, only thing I would like to comment is, remember now that Paul is writing to a small group of believers up in the city of Thessalonica. They're in uh, predominantly northern Greece. And it's uh, a group that he'd only spent a few weeks with. And yet it was a group that he had brought so far with their understanding of the scriptures that uh, he could say, and you know. Well, like someone just said at break time, you know, there's more to this than meets the eye. See, when the Apostle Paul brought these people out of paganism, their whole understanding of this was uncluttered. And they didn't have to undo 30, 40, 50 years of false teachings and false ideas and false doctrines in order to see the truth. They were, they were virgin territory. And Iris and I have noticed that, even on people who write, that uh, they probably had had almost nothing of a spiritual understanding. And uh, unbelievable. Sometimes in just one program, the Lord just totally opens their heart. Well, again, it's because they haven't been cluttered with a lot of other things over the years. And so this is what Paul had here, were pagans, recently converted by Paul's gospel, and then he could certainly write, don't you know these things? All right, verse 6 is where we quit in our last half hour, how that there has to be a restraining force now, beginning at some point in human history, to hold everything in check, lest things start rolling too fast, and the Antichrist would make his appearance before the right time. And I think that's all that's implied here, is that God has instituted a restrainer so that the Antichrist could not be brought on the scene ahead of time. And then we hopefully made plain that the restrainer is the work of the Holy Spirit as he indwells you and I as believers. And, uh, in my closing seconds of the last half hour, I was making mention that even in Israel tonight, with the tremendous chasm between the secular, how shall I call it, the unbelieving Jews, I mean, they take no respect for the scriptures, the Old Testament, whatever, they are secular. They, they don't take God in their life at all. In fact, I was reminded as I read that little article, when Iris and I were in Israel the very first time, and that goes back too many years, but we came out of the hotel dining room after dinner, and uh, a well-dressed Jewish businessman, he said, you're from America, aren't you? And we said, yes. Well, he said, what do you think of our little country? Well, we were. We were impressed at how far they had come in just those few years after the Six-Day War. And so I just, you know, earnestly said, uh, I said, it's amazing what God has done here. You know what his answer was? 
God didn't have a thing to do with it. We did it. Well, see, that's the secular attitude. God has nothing to do with it. But you see, on the other hand, you've got that percentage in Israel who are still, as we would call, religious. They're orthodox, and they are still spending their time, of course, in their Old Testament scriptures. But it's gotten to the place now, as I mentioned in my closing seconds, that the secular part of Israel will be for anything that the religious segment is against and vice versa, whether it's political, economical, moral, whatever. As soon as those rabbis express themselves, the secular world comes up against it. Well, you see, we're in the same situation in America, not quite to that extreme, but we're up against the same thing. Just as soon as we try to oppose something, then we're just called whatever, mean-spirited, we're just simply against everything. Well, of course we are. It's our responsibility as believers to stand against these things that we know are biblically wrong. But yet our nation has become so secular now that regardless of what the outcome, outcome may be, they're going to be counter against us simply because we're standing on the scriptures. But this is our role. This is why God has left us here that we can be used of the Holy Spirit to be a restraining force to hold back these forces of evil. Because we know the minute that we are out of here, and we're going to see this in the next verse, that the wickedness is just going to run rampant across the planet. And that, of course, is what justifies then the wrath and the vexation of God. All right, so verse 6. Now you know that he who withholdeth, or the one who restrains, so that he, the Antichrist, might be revealed in his time, or not before the time. Now then, verse 7. Paul says, For the mystery, or the secret of iniquity, doth already work. Now, of course, there's probably a debate. When does Paul feel this mystery of iniquity began? Did it begin, did it begin as soon as he went out amongst the Gentile world with the gospel? Possibly, but I prefer to think that this mystery of iniquity actually began at the Tower of Babel. And my reason for thinking that is that all of your false religions of the world, and you've heard me say this on the program over and over. Every false religion, even our modern day cults, and throw them in with the Oriental religions, and they all have their roots going right back to the Tower of Babel. Everything false goes back to the Tower of Babel. Then, if you have done any study at all of these false religions, you'll notice that almost all of them, maybe not all, but almost all of them, at the core of their belief system is what they call the mysteries. Now you just think for a minute. The Oriental religions are mystery religions. And it's simply because only the inner sanctum of their priesthood have access to these mysteries. And you'll find them all the way up through every false religion. And so this is what makes me think that this term mystery then refers to all these false pagan religions that even Paul was confronting now face to face by bringing these people out of it. And so indeed, the mysteries of paganism, of false worship, has been already revealed and was on the scene as Paul wrote this letter. So the mystery, the secrets of this iniquity, doth already work. It was permeating the whole human race. All right, now then the next part is another interesting. A lot of debate over it, but I think if you just look at it in the big picture here, that Paul is dealing with the body of Christ being taken out before this final seven years of wrath comes in, so he says, now in verse 7, 
But he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. Now those are personal pronouns. So again, I'm thinking you have to give the credit to the Holy Spirit is the personal pronoun that he who now hindereth the indwelling Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that we saw in verse 6. And so he that hindereth will hinder. He's never going to stop. He's never going to give up. You know, I've made the comment on the program before, and it didn't cause anybody to <laughs> shoot me on the road or something like that. But although I have had people say, lest you carry a gun, and I've said, no. Well, they said, some of the things you say, somebody's going to feel like shooting you. Well, that could be, but so far they haven't tried. But anyway, I, I've always felt that uh, this, this hindering work of the Holy Spirit is such that until the body of Christ is gone, it's going to be like a dam in the river. And the iniquity is just piling up and piling up, just like a large reservoir. All right, so look at the verse again, that he who hindereth, now I know the King James says letteth, but again, if you have a Bible with a marginal, they've all realized that the word uh, meaning has changed 180 degrees. So the person of the Holy Spirit who will hinder until he be taken out of the way. Now, if the Holy Spirit is working in the believer today to withstand the forces of wickedness, then it stands to reason that as soon as he's taken out, there will be like the floodgates of wickedness that will come over the world. Uh, I'm thinking whether I should or shouldn't, but I think we will. Come back with me to Luke chapter 21. These are the words of the Lord himself. Luke 21, dropping down to verse 24, honey. Luke 21, verse 24. And since the Lord of glory spoke it, I think we have every reason in the world to believe it. He knew the end from the beginning, even as he walked on earth. All right, in verse 24, he is making a prophetic statement that a lot of people think that uh, took place uh, or will take place at the end. But he's not. He's speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman general Titus in 70 A.D. Luke 21, verse 24, And they, that is the Jewish people, they shall fall by the edge of the sword, shall be led away captive into all Nations. Now there's the clue that this is not referring to the end time or Armageddon or anything like that, because at that time Israel will not be dispersed, but rather they will be made ready for the kingdom. So this is a reference to the 70 A.D. destruction of Jerusalem. All right, and they shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, in other words, they'd be under Gentile control from the time of Titus' destruction of the city until, there's your time word, doesn't give the day and the month of the year, but there is a day, month, and year when it's going to happen, and the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. Now we realize that the times of the Gentiles are the filling up of the wrath of God. And the comparison that I always like to use out of the Old Testament is go back to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. We're in another time of God dealing with a Gentile group of people. He had the same mindset that he would give these Gentile nations, which of course we now know as the Canaanites, 
who were in the land while Israel was down in Egypt. But he deals with them on the same basis. And that's why I think it's appropriate to compare these two portions. Genesis 15, and you might as well stay or start at verse 13. Genesis 15, starting at verse 13. And he, that is the Lord, said unto Abram, Know of a surety. Boy, I like that kind of language, don't you? I mean, this isn't gobbledygook. This isn't guesswork. This is fact. Know of a surety that thy seed, that is the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, further down the line, that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, a reference to Egypt, and they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Now, we just talked about that at break time. And uh, it would seem that they would have been in slavery the whole 400 years, but we know from chronology that they were not. So this is not a refer reference to the total time in Egypt's in slavery, but rather from the call of Abram until Moses leads them out in the Exodus would be the 400 years, or the 430, really. All right, but that's not what we want to look at. Verse 14, also that nation, Egypt, whom they shall serve, God says, I will judge. Well, now you know he did that. The plagues took care of that little bit of prophecy. Afterward, that is, after the plagues, they, the children of Abraham, shall come out with great substance. And you know that happened. Verse 15, Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. And we know that happened. He lived to be 175. Then in verse 16, but in the fourth generation, they, the children of Israel, down in Egypt, remember, in the fourth generation, they shall come here, that is to Canaan, where God is speaking to Abram, they shall come hither again. Now, why is God waiting 400 years? The next part of the verse. The next statement, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet, what's the word? Full. All right, what's the picture? God is going to give those Canaanite nations 400 years to come out of their life of abject immorality. 400 years he's going to give them because God knows it's going to take that long. But even after 400 years, instead of coming out of that iniquity, what happened? They went deeper and deeper until it got to the place that almost every despicable act of immorality, the Canaanites practiced it routinely. Now, when their cup of iniquity was full, the 400 years had now been completed. What did God decree on the Canaanite people? Destroy them. Destroy them. Don't leave an old man of years or an infant of days. Cleanse the land of them. Why? Because they had had 400 years to clean up their act and they rejected it. And as a result of it then, God in complete fairness and justice could pour out his wrath on those Canaanite nations and give the land to the nation of Israel. All right, now you put those two segments in comparison then. Now come back to Luke 21, and you have the same kind of a picture. God has now been giving the Gentile world 1,900 plus years of his grace. The gospel is going out across the world in one way or another, and they're having every opportunity to come out of their wickedness. But instead, what's happening? They're going deeper and deeper. I, I, you know, I don't trust the media an awful lot, but some things, you know, rings true. And that is the AIDS epidemic is just getting beyond human comprehension. 
Now, they like to keep it quiet, but the fact is that there are areas of the world. I read an article again in the Daily Oklahoma just the other day. There are certain areas of the world where in a few more years there will not be enough AIDS-free people to actually run government. And what's causing it? Well, basically, wickedness, immorality. Now, I know there are a lot of innocents. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But for the most part, it's triggered by their gross immorality. And as you read the accounts around the world of how all of the civilized world is just going deeper and deeper into the things of the flesh. Well, what are they doing? Just like the Canaanites, they're filling their cup of iniquity. And it's going to come to the full mark when the day of the Lord is triggered. And the day of the Lord is going to be that outpouring of the wrath and the vexation of God. All right, now then coming back to 2 Thessalonians. So this is all of the background that Paul has poured out on these young in the Lord Thessalonians. All right. So he says this mystery of iniquity, this outpouring of wickedness, this outpouring of the desires of the flesh. Sorry about this. Come back to Galatians. Let's see what the book itself calls it. That's the best way. The book is far more graphic than I dare to be. And these are the things that are causing the world today to fill up their cup of iniquity. And when it's full, Jerusalem will finally come out from under the rule of the Gentile world. All right, Galatians chapter, yeah, chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, honey, and start at verse 17. I didn't even have it myself. Galatians 5, verse 17. Now, in this verse, of course, he's dealing with you and I as believers. We're in the midst of all this, and it's a warfare. Galatians 5, verse 17. For the flesh, the old Adamic nature, lusteth, or I like to use the word, warreth, against the spirit, the new nature. And the spirit wars against the flesh. That's our Christian warfare. And these two natures now are contrary the one to the other. In other words, they just have a hard time cohabiting, don't they? All right, they're contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Because the flesh says, do this, but the Spirit says, no. And so we have to abide by the leading of the Spirit. Now verse 18 says that, that if you are led of the Spirit, you're not under the law, you're not under the temptations of the flesh. Now here it comes, verse 19. Now these are the things that we as believers, through the power of the Holy Spirit, are to withstand. These are the things that the world is reveling in. These are the things that the Canaanites reveled in. And so we are to be aware that this is where we are as the Spirit now leads us. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest. And here they are, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. See, and that's what Paul had to deal with personally. Witchcraft, which is part and parcel of idolatry. Hatred, and my, we're seeing that show its ugly head. Variance, emulations, wrath, a lack of self-control, strife, sedition, never satisfied with things as they are. In fact, most of your wars on the planet tonight are just exactly that. You have guerrillas up in the mountains of all these various nations, unhappy with the status quo, and they cause misery on everybody else. That's sedition. You know, I think I read again the other day, 43 wars are raging on the planet right now. 
oh, not world war, but their war nevertheless to the people involved. Their houses are being destroyed. Their women are being ravished. It's war, all right? So sedition is part and parcel of it. Heresy, envying, murder, drunkenness. Boy, I'll tell you what, we're getting so brainwashed, we're supposed to get to the place that even drunkenness is just supposed to be treated like kids play. I mean, after all, they're kids, let them do it. But drunkenness is listed in these things that are of the flesh and the things that God hates. Revelings and such like. Oh, Paul says, the which I tell you before, as I've told you in times past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then, of course, the next verse is the other side of the coin, and that is the behavior and the lifestyle of the believer. And what a difference. All right, now let's come back for the closing moment or two in 2 Thessalonians again. Verse 7. We're just going to keep hammering it away, hammering away. The Holy Spirit dwelling in the believer is this restraining force. And what we have to be restraining is this iniquity that is already at work, has been for centuries. And the Holy Spirit working through you and I, the believer, will hinder and he will continue to hinder until he be taken out of the way. Now just mull that over, that you and I, led by the Spirit, are to be a restraining factor against all these lusts of the flesh, and we are to be the force that God can use to maintain control and maintain a semblance of sanity. Because listen, once the Christian influence is removed, you and I cannot imagine what this world is going to fall into. It's going to fall into anarchy. It's going to fall into absolute breakdown in everything moral. And that in turn will bring justly then the wrath of God. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.